have some people that don't even play ball, don't even dance, and they act like they're 90 years old. I generally don't participate in the stomp dance itself because I feel like that is something that is, uh, uh, it's almost their communion, it's their worship. And uh, I'm not a member of it. I have, I have an appreciation for it. I love the people very much there, and uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by their belief and uh, the fact that they hold it very strongly and know that it must be right, as is mine and as is you know, many others as far as the religion is concerned. Uh, so it, it does strike me as being very much a, a religious society. The music from these dances would stay with us long after we left the grounds. Chief Smith told us that the real meaning of the words to the songs can't be translated. They were handed down from generation to generation long before the Sequoia alphabet, and over the many years, the real meaning was lost. Now they're used in a spirit of fellowship and celebration. Well, as the energy level of the dance increased, so did the efforts of photographers Johnny Thomason and Mark Wilson. <laughs> Just after midnight, Chief Smith, his brother Croslin, a high medicine man, and some of the others talked with me about their artifacts. Wampum belts, belts that would hold the same significance for Ketuwas as the Dead Sea Scrolls do for many in the white world. Belts that are only brought out for members to see during special occasions. Sometimes, as William and Croslin spoke, it was difficult for me to follow their thought line or their course of information. But again, there was a reason. And they also give it to you in, uh, in a very uh, veiled way sometimes. It's through stories and, uh, and events that are described uh, in which you have to uh, pick out the substance of those stories and figure out what they're talking about because it's, uh, they don't really give you a, uh, a real straight answer up front. They want you to, uh, they want you to think about it. And uh, I know it, uh, in talking with William, I've had the same feeling sometimes that uh, uh, you'd be talking along and, and uh, suddenly realize that uh, you're not fully understanding what he says and you try to think about it and at first it doesn't make sense until you do think about it. Well, at this point, I was thinking about it. And on this night, my education would continue by way of stories and legends. Chief Smith wanted me to understand exactly what the belts actually mean to the people. For the time being, they would not be shown in our presence until the elders felt we were ready. Chief Smith said we were not the first to try this documentation. He said they'd already turned away at the Smithsonian and numerous television networks, newspapers, and any number of writers and photographers. But he said that according to Ketuwa legend, when the time is right in this world and when leaders of other nations and other governments are in disagreement, a white man with blue veins would tell the Ketuwa story. He felt that prophecy was now being fulfilled, for he said I was the first white man to sit in council to request permission to tell their story. And he said, it was given. As of tonight, almost all of their ceremonies were committed to videotape, but it would be a year before the belts were shown to us. Now, I'd be back here many times, and several times with my family as my education continued. In the summer of 1983, we came here to the Red Bird Smith Cemetery. Located near Lake Tingiller, it is an Indian burial ground for several families, all members of the Ketuwa faith. Redbird Smith, recognized as a chief of great wisdom and knowledge, and the man responsible for reshaping of the tribe after the Trail of Tears. Many others were marked by natural stones with Cherokee script. A great deal of history rests here. Ketuwazu helped write the pages of that history. We disturbed nothing, taking with us only the silent images of this peaceful setting. July 19th is a major holiday. It marks the birthday of Redbird Smith, who members also say possessed a very strong belief in God. In addition, Sequoia's birthday isn't known, so it's celebrated as well this time. Their pictures, along with pictures of Chief Smith's father, are hung on the east side of the fire. 
There's a day of stickball, dinner on the ground, sermons, and a night of dancing in the best Ketuwa tradition. Then, almost a year and a half after my first visit with the council, word came. The belts and their meanings would be waiting on a Saturday afternoon here at Chief Smith's home, which he built himself in the Cooks and Hills of Oklahoma. The belts had been delivered to his home that morning, and he had them on display for us, hanging on a wall, made up of hundreds of thousands of very small pieces of hollow coral, and according to the chief, the twine or leather bindings are original. Although they don't appear to be, each is heavy, 10 to 15 pounds, and for the next three hours, each was carefully explained. You have your mind clean, pure, love, then you're fallen in this line. Stands for the seven clans of bylaw, a small organization bylaw, in the name of God. Each knot of these represents the clans and the way we see the color that's how white and how clean and healthy it's supposed to be. The, the next belt was represented by the Tommy Hawk, was used. They were bloody and dirty and dangerous. But when the, tre the treaty of peace was signed with the people, that's what this means. They're not bloody. It means all white. If you follow the bylaw instruction of these belt, the rules, regulation, your mind, your heart, your body should be clean as this white is the way it is. With each a meaning, a reason to live, and walk the path of the Ketuwa. As he talked, the message became very clear. This is their original Bible, the way set in coral and twine, carefully woven and tied. Then, in the hand of Sequoia, the Ketuwa commandments. That means we belong to that in there, the way he says. We belong to God. And it's Israel. God is Israel, Israel, uh, Psalm, the Israel belong to God. Now I understood why he waited so long before showing us the belts, why he made sure that their meeting was clear, no hidden messages. I suddenly felt as though a bond had developed between us, unspoken because words weren't necessary. His gift to me, the simplicity of his faith, mine in return to tell this story based on his truth. In other words, this is a look at the Ketuwa faith as it now lives. You don't have to accept or reject. Just understand that for members, it's all that's needed. The message would carry more meaning for me when the belts were again shown to the people and the elders knew that. Later, on the front porch, he talked of the medicine and the legends behind it. A medicine is benefit for people, illness, and to help people in order to survive and get by safely. Everything we see on earth, it's used for something good, to benefit, as well as something that's poison, like poison ivy that could be used for something. He talked to me of Indian cures for everything under the sun. For instance, a major problem for folks in the city. It depends on what kind of cold. There's a, there's a different kind of cold, you know. Could be on a kind of effect of summer cold, when a cold, we use some time, it's, just, it's on account of a cold, infection, having a flu, or bad cold ache. Uh, could be used by heating, by fire. Or you can make a, a tea that they will drink warm. Or different types of weed that you make, and boil it and drink it. And there are other medicine that could be used for heat fever. That's one thing I'm familiar with. A lot of people have call it goat weed. Make a tea and drink it cold. It will cool your system down and it will turn the heat, fever down. But medicine alone is not enough. Prayers and songs in Cherokee. The final ingredient, of course, is faith. Faith in God and the medicine. The results caught us by surprise. For instance, Ross Swimmer was told 
he had lymphatic cancer. He finished the prescribed treatments in Houston, and the results were positive. But then he went to Crosland Smith for the medicine. I, I certainly uh, had no reason to do it simply as a symbolic gesture. I wouldn't have, uh, have uh, uh, taken the medicine if it were, uh, you know, if I knew that uh, you know, it was just symbolic so to speak. I had some idea that they, uh, uh, just, just of my own uh, uh, knowledge, know that most or, or many contemporary medicines are derived from the, uh, the natural uh, medicines that the Indians developed years ago. And uh, Carlson and, and the folks there uh, uh, certainly have a, a handle on those uh, medicinal roots and herbs and things. And, uh, you know, very well might uh, might have a lot of the answer to uh, common illnesses that, uh, that a lot of those uh, roots and herbs and things have been synthesized into drugs today and, and combined with some other chemicals that make them more potent, but uh, they still serve the same purpose. Uh, I guess uh, as far as the chemotherapy is concerned, most of those chemicals are, are artificially developed now, but uh, uh, the medicines of the past. In, in fact, in my ancestry, uh, one of the swimmers uh, was a medicine man and wrote a book on uh, what was then a couple hundred years ago, contemporary Cherokee medicines, and listed all the herbs and the roots and the mushrooms and everything else that were used uh, medicinally. And, and many of those are, in fact, uh, extracted today and used in, in everyday medicines. So, you know, I was fairly confident that it uh, it certainly wasn't going to hurt me, and if anything, it might, uh, you know, hold some of the secret to helping. Three different things that I used just passed on to me that could be used. Weeds, one of them, it comes to the point of the, we call it the yellow root, is to be made.